is John Dawson of Patio Daddio Barbecue in Boise, Idaho, and I've got it locked on the 50,000 gigawatt blowtorch of the internet that is Barbecue Central. Start the game! Let's go! We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Welcome to the really big Barbecue Central show, a show that talks about all things important to the world of barbecue and grilling, originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I am your program host, Greg Rempe, happy to have you aboard on your Tuesday you want to jump in on the show tonight, more than happy to have you. A phone call or email will get you in here so you can get off on the hot barbecue and grilling take that you have. And here's how you do that. You can get in touch with the show by calling 216-220-0966. Email Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. On the Twitter and Instagram, said BBQ Central Show. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, thebbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's happening. Coming up in about 12 minutes from now, it's the second Tuesday of a brand new month. And, of course, that means a visit from the guy that has created the most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling website. So much so that it earned him a return trip to the 2020 Barbecue Hall of Fame semifinal names list. And a guy who has been appearing on this show for a decade, perhaps even more. I think even more now that I recollect quickly in my head, perhaps his first year of appearance on any form of this show. Because remember, all the way back in the beginning, this was a podcast in its very essence, a pre recorded podcast long-form interview that was then edited down and released once per week. And I think Meat had made his debut appearance in what would have been the 2007 Barbecue Ribs Roundtable. Maybe it was even a little earlier than that. So been around the show as long, pretty much as long as it has been going in whatever form it's been going in. Meathead from AmazingRibs.com will join us. Father's Day coming up here shortly. We also have some Hall of Fame stuff to talk about. We also have a number of other items to talk about, answering your questions as well. So feel free to email in and call in. These are things that I can do. It's a real live show, like a real radio show, where you could call in and ask an expert question or ask an expert guest questions if you want. Have them answered right here on the show. And then it's also being recorded. So It will be able to be listened to tomorrow and Friday and 10 years from now, on and on, through perpetuity, as we said last week. So that's the first hour as usual. Then we'll move into the second hour. A guy who it has been perhaps a three-year span since last he has graced the internet airwaves. The guy who was widely credited with being the barbecue TV master exposing millions upon millions, perhaps a generation of folks sparking their interest in barbecue, grilling, competition barbecue, and all things in between. An Emmy Award-winning TV producer, writer, the list goes on and on, and friend of this show, John Marcus reappearing in the second hour to lead up. Very much looking forward to catching up with John. On this show. And then 35 past the hour, or as we call it the bullpen segment, longtime sponsor of the show, host of the Butcher Barbecue podcast, creator of the Butcher Barbecue products line and the wild seasonings product line. 
Dave Bosk will be joining me because guess what, folks? In case you missed it, Dave Bosk is coming out with a brand new product that we'll be talking about. We'll also chat up a little bit on how the first 31 episodes of the podcast have been going. And Dave promises to sound absolutely magnificent tonight because as a host of a podcast, there's really no excuse for having bad audio when you come on the show if you have your – now, certainly there's perhaps more than a few exceptions to the rule that if I had a, a podcast host on that their audio would be substantially lacking. But I know Dave's audio is great on his show. That will translate here on the show. I think the last time he was on, he had the equipment on and he sounded great. So uh, at, at very least – Barring content, fidelity will be top shelf. And sometimes that's all you can ask for. But Dave always brings the content strong. So I am absolutely thrilled to have him back on to talk about a new product launch. Always love to get the inner workings and ideas of why this particular product decides to see the light of day versus keeping it to himself. But as we long know, Dave has been introducing products to the market right along, ones that he is tried on the competition circuit that folks have asked about that he is constantly refining and creating and we got one ready to talk about this evening so there's your show meathead first hour john marcus and dave bosca in the second hour tell all your friends and neighbors the show is on do it socially and tell them to follow me while you're at it at bbq central show on instagram twitter and snapchat and tiktok slash bbq central show on facebook where you're getting the video feed as well Once again, as I reference the video feed, for quite a substantial amount of time, we were simulcasting to both the Facebook video platform and the YouTube platform. If you missed last week, this is the only time I'm going to repeat it, especially if you're only a live listener and you missed it. You're not on YouTube. Uh, I know. We're not going to YouTube anymore. The ROI is not there for the bandwidth that I'm using to get there. So we are recording at the same time as we're going live to Facebook. So I will get that video, and it will be up on YouTube tomorrow. I did a well-researched test this past week, garnered the same amount of views after the fact that I did live, had solid connections all the way through the show last week. That's all I care about. The solid connections and how good are we sounding and are we having dropouts? Because the more people we're adding in, the more bandwidth we're using. And as we have learned here in Wycliffe, it's as fast as I'm going to get. And there are zero plans for adding quicker internet speeds here for whatever reason. We are not here to be progressive. We're here to stay put in Wycliffe and all forms and fashions, especially the internet speeds. I'm as high as it's going to get right now. So I have to conserve where I need to. Also, I do want to mention this. As an early birthday present, longest running embedded correspondent from Texas, Doug Scheide, sends me this. Anybody ever seen this? This is called uh, grill floss. So as you can see right here, there's a little uh, half circle right here that's going to fit over the grill grate, individual bars, and you're going to be able to scrape off and then you can obviously work all the way around and really get a good cleaning it did come uh, so you can see right here there's a screw this is a ends up being a commercial grill floss but they're not affiliated with the show i'm just giving my thanks and praise to doug shiding uh, this little uh what what is uh phillips uh, is comes it will uh, remove this particular one and there's a whole different size and by the way there's a, a an additional size that's hidden in the sleeve where it's tucked in so there's up to four different size bars that it can accommodate and barbecue bristly journalist Derek Richard would highly approve of this because there are no bristles pardon the pun to snap off on this. So while there might be a little bit more time investment here to go through each bar, we can guarantee our safety and our guest safety and our family's safety because there are no items that will break off. And if this thing breaks off and lands on the grill, I'm going to see that. If it's laying in my steak, I will see it. 
So this is also one of the items that could be used to replace. And as you can see, it just glide right over the bars, taking away all your grease and grime and nastiness. And Doug has assured me that they will absolutely clean, pristine your grill grates. So especially if you're going to do pictures and do some of the social media that you people like to do, it's great. Now let me ask you this before we get to the first break. After the Day Neal interview last week, did anyone get down for the $9.99 pay-per-view that kicked off at 6 p.m. Eastern tonight? I watched the free roundtable last night. Some minor tech issues, but pretty good all the way around. My overriding interest, though, is who is spending the money to watch barbecue? I'll be asking John Marcus this next hour as well. Is it a good idea? And are people paying to watch it? I can tell you one centralite is, who happens to be the Colorado embedded correspondent, Dennis Busso is giving me a full write-up as we speak. I can tell you this, if there's anything I brought to market, anything, pay-per-view, Barbecue Central show, or bad rubs, or you name it, two people I can guarantee would buy no matter what, Dennis Busso and John Solberg, not necessarily in that order. They are champions of live fire in all regards. Meathead coming up out of the break. Let me talk to you quickly about Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for all things barbecue. 13 perfectly balanced flavors of rubs and seasonings. Sweet money, cattle prod, cash cow, all proven winners on the competition circuit in backyards like mine. They also own Granny's Barbecue Sauce, so if you're tired of what's existing on the market today, and you want something you can just pour right out of the bottle, and it's great. Granny's meets that. Now, if you want a great base sauce where you can further tweak, you can do that with Granny's as well. Aside from the premium selection of rubs and sauces, Big Papa's offering the very best pellet charcoal and wood cookers available today. If you're looking for a versatile smoker that's easy to use, why not check out that Mac 2-Star General Pellet Cooker? Big Papa's the exclusive Mac dealer, even offering special packages. Nobody else can do that. Not a fan of pellet smokers? Fine. I have three. Take a look at the Old Hickory Ace BP, the only charcoal smoker that Big Papa trusts on his competition trail. Not sure of what kind of grill you need? Okay. Give him a call and ask questions. That's the best way. 877-828-0727. That's 877-828-0727. Or shop their website at BigPapaSmokers.com. Again, spelled out B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A smokers.com. A widely respected online retailer. What do we say about the internet? Beware. But I can tell you with 100% assurance, they get no more ethical, no more trustworthy. And fewer places I would rather do business with on the internet, regardless of industry, than BigPapaSmokers.com. So check them out. B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers.com and Meathead leads out of the break. Stick around. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Show studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Hey, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by Butcher Barbecue, makers of award-winning injections, marinades, and rubs, and seasonings, and barbecue sauces, and grilling oils. And tonight, in the second hour, we will be unveiling a new product. Believe it or not, all the Butcher Barbecue products tested on the competition circuit as well as in backyards worldwide. Be the pit master of your neighborhood and visit ButcherBBQ.com to stock up right now. All right, second Tuesday of the month brings a visit from the creator of the most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling website on the face of the earth. It is, of course, Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. Hey, Meathead. Hold on, Meathead. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. I'm sorry. I, I got lost in my technology. Uh, let me let me reintroduce you. I'm sorry. Joining me now, 
the creator of the most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling website and less trafficked hairline, Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. Wow, we what a look you have going on, Meathead. You know, it was time for a haircut, and I just got out the beard trimmer and went crazy. You did that yourself? I did it myself. Wow, look at you. I just go... <laughs> so what does your wife it's, think? I mean, that's the most the important part. Cut. Yeah. She seems to like it, you know? Oh, she seems to like it. What does that mean? Well, she says she likes it, but who, who knows if she <laughs> means it? All right, well, what do you think? Do you like it? I am I like not having to fuss with hair. Yeah, I heard um, that. Uh, it, it's a little weird. I feel breezes behind my ears, but... Uh, I don't look like uh, what everybody thinks I look like anymore. Well, here's the good news. And as somebody who for many years had toyed with the idea of doing exactly what you did, ultimately I've done it any number of times, but there were at least three years where I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then I was like, what if I do it? And I have craters and valleys. (laughs) Because you've seen some dudes that have great hair, And then they shave it off, and oh, my God, it's a train wreck underneath it. Nothing you can do about it. I mean, it is what it is. But it is a a little bit of testicular fortitude to actually get the blades on the hair and then take it down to see what's there. Now, luckily, my head was very round, and there were no Mars landing strips or anything like that. And as I quickly review, you have quite a nice, round, not unattractive head. So very good. It's very nice. I like it. Well, Greg, I I don't know how to take a compliment about the shape of my head from a fellow male. Well, take it but... <laughs> take it as a strong, virile man, meathead. This is, we're talking like men here, for crying out loud. But, you know, it's not the first. I, 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 wore, I, I had a flat top all through high school. Hmm. I was on the swim team and played football, so this was the jock look. So I'm back to my jock look. All right. Well, uh, Meathead's going to be trying out for the Chicago Bears this season as well. He's got his hair ready <laughs> got to her go. locker. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, so, her locker look. Yes, there you go. So uh, we got a bunch of different stuff here to talk about this evening, Meathead, and uh, not the least of which is a, a great revelation, uh, much perhaps to your chagrin, but last or two weeks ago, I guess it was, uh, Emily Park was back on my show as we were unveiling exclusively the 2020 Barbecue Hall of Fame. And uh, it ends up being a Cozy Corners, Desiree Robinson, Aaron Franklin from Franklin Barbecue, and Joe Don Davidson or Oklahoma Joe or Joe Davidson or however you know him. And uh, look, uh, as we looked through the list, and I think we had had uh, off-air discussions uh, because the last time you were on, I think the next day, we were going to be unveiling the list of semifinalists, so uh, we didn't get a chance to chat about it. But when you look up and down that list of semifinalists, that is a very strong list of names. I yes, can't. I, I could argue one, and I probably wouldn't even bother making that argument, but uh, mm-hmm. at least eight out of the nine were very, very strong. Yeah, I, I, I felt the same way as I studied the list. And I think I told you this, and I told others, I thought I was number four on that list, and they since they only – induct three that left me out and that's what happened i don't know whether i was number four or number five but you know the three who were selected clearly very strong very deserving and there were others who didn't get selected like john marcus whom you've got coming up in the second hour darren warth who is absolutely the best competition cook i've ever tasted undoubtedly uh, was also on that list um, uh, you know, Rodney, um, Scott, um, uh, a man renowned for a whole hog doing it old school, um, also very deserving. Uh, you know, it was a powerful, a strong list yeah. next year. If those same names come back and a lot of people who came in this year had been nominated last year, like Desiree and Aaron, they had both been nominated last year, yes, as was I, yep. um, If those names come back this year, maybe I'll have a better chance. You know, I would be honored. It would I won't be I won't be falsely modest and say I really would love to be inducted. But, um, you know, as they say in Hollywood, it's an honor to be nominated. Right. Two years in a row. You jokingly called me the Susan Lucci of barbecue. Uh, for those who don't know, Susan Lucci, uh, a daytime TV star who got nominated for... Uh, it was like Andy's 11 year. times, right? Or 12 times yeah, before she finally so, got through. 
you know, it, it could be a good running joke if I get nominated and don't make it again next year. It's an honor to be nominated. I know who I am. Um, our readers know who I am. And uh, I don't need uh, outside uh, verification that uh, what we do is good for the good for barbecue and good for our readers. I wonder, though, Meathead, if I might have caused you any undue angst or fluttered any uh, extra hope in the fact that I had taken a very <laughs> unscientific poll with my embedded correspondence the night before where we really dug through the minutia of who we thought was going to get in. Now, of course, as we review the tape, we were one-third correct and two-thirds incorrect, which means we're more <laughs> dumb than smart. But we figured that with the amount of people that you have touched and the amount of people that come out of the woodwork or uh, when I meet people on the street, they know amazing. If they don't know you specifically, mm -hmm. uh, they know AmazingRibs.com. They yeah. have seen the returns on Google. They have been on the website. Maybe they're members of that Pitmaster Club. Uh, it, is a, it is a landscape that has touched literally millions upon millions over the years that you have done it. So I Thank thought you. I was very, I thought my bets were pretty good playing with the yep. house money that Meathead, that it could have been a year where the second year nominees who were repeats all got in, you and Aaron and Desiree, but yeah. uh, unfortunately it was uh, two thirds of that. Shows what the hell you know. I not uh, much, but we knew that for a long time, Mita. Let's be honest. But you know, you 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 even I think suggested that I get a watch uh, show together, and I declined. I I had a feeling I was not going to make it this year. I like my odds for next year, but I you know I I'm just going to keep doing what I do. Yeah. Uh, when I got really good grades in high school and college, I thought I was going to go out. I was going to change the world. I was going to be a um, you know, maybe I'd be president or something oh. like that. Uh, but, you know, when I got out of high school and I got into college, I found out I was just an average Joe and I was not going to change the world. And uh, when I got into the workforce and I started working and I did a bunch of things, I, you know, I realized that I was just going to be another guy. And then Back around the year 2003, 4, 5, I forget when it was, I started this barbecue website, and it took off, and something has happened. I have discovered that we really are changing the world. Sure. People write me every day and say, I got laid last night because of you. I get emails saying, come home from work, the kids say, mom, can dad cook tonight? Mm -hmm. We have helped so many people learn to cook. I was just exchanging email or comments with a few of the people watching. Somebody said that they were going to do the pastrami recipe for yes, our website. Right. Somebody else chimed in and said it's great. Maybe the best recipe on the website. That recipe is just killer. Um, there's just so many good recipes, so much good technique, so much we've taught. Four million people a month wow. come to that website. and they've been, and, and that number has been fairly steady for two or three years now, ups and downs. It's just millions of people, millions of people. But when you look at the Hall of Fame, the current Hall of Fame as it stands, there's 22 living members. Most of them are restaurateurs, competition cooks, uh, a few who are authors. The only one who is primarily an author, which is what really I am, a, a writer, a photographer, a recipe developer, is... Um, Stephen Raiklin. Yep. Um, so it is not something that leans in my direction. And uh, that's okay. I know what I do is good, and I'm happy to continue doing it. Uh, Meathead from AmazingRibs.com joining us here on the show as we're doing a little bit of recap on the Barbecue Hall of Fame. So we'll see what happens next year. It was uh, fun for my side getting to unveil the semifinalist this year, which we didn't get to do yeah. last year. So we added Let's a talk exclusive about that. there. That was very Two nice. years in a row. You yep. get the honor yes. of announcing the nominees and then the honor of announcing uh, the winners. I mean, all right, let's talk about next year's Hall of Fame. Who should be the nominees? Well, let's start with the ones this year who didn't make it, and then let's extend it wow, to wait. Greg Rempe, Rodney Scott, who didn't make it, John Marcus, who didn't make it. How about Daniel Vaughn, who's on the selection committee? But Daniel um, certainly should be considered the only full-time a barbecue writer 
in the world for uh, a, a major magazine or newspaper, Texas Monthly, has books, phenomenal knowledge and expertise, influence so many people, absolutely should be there. What about Amy Mills? Her dad, Mike, is there for his restaurant, but Amy is running a barbecue school now, teaching restaurateurs. Sterling Ball, one of your uh, sponsors yep. from Big Papa Barbecue, uh, uh, Big Papa Smokers. Um, uh, Smokers. Um, by the way, you were plugging his Mac Two Star. I've got a Mac Two Star and I love it, um, and I bought it from Sterling. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of really talented people out there that should be in, right. and I, you know, I would include you among them. Let me ask you something though. We get to a point now, so. The inherent problem with the barbecue hall of fame, and I don't want to get into the weeds here because we have got other things to talk about. But the inherent yeah, we problem. Got, this doesn't really interest anybody out there, but you and me. Right, we're 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 uh, satisfying ourselves here. Uh, so let's just uh, keep <laughs> keep doing that just for a minute. <laughs> just keep doing that here just for a minute. You know, the problem is that there wasn't in the beginning a huge induction of folks from the past that deserve to be in. So you create a big initial base of entrance. So they're trying to piece it forward each year by uh, mm -hmm. adding categories. Now we're going to take the categories out. Now we're going to add this. Now we're going to add that. We're going to put this many people in. And it, it always yeah, feels like sure. there's, uh, yeah, but it always feels like there's always going to be a tremendous amount of catch up to do before you really get into like a uh, NFL Hall of Fame or a Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, until that gap is somehow corrected, and I don't know if it will ever be, I think there will always be some kind of a vacillating situation or consternation about the Barbecue Hall Disagree. of Fame until that. Really? Disagree. Yeah, I think they're doing it right. I think, I, I mean, I'm think. i not I'm saying they're not doing it right. I'm just saying that the way that it is existing, there is a gap of – however many hundred years of folks that are deserving to go uh, in. No, I mean, if sure. you're going to define the Hall of Fame as people who've really been important, there's probably no more than other 10 or 15 people out there. Um, uh, the, From I just the whole the of barbecue, Meathead? you got to be kidding me. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, all right. We just lost um, Hecky here in Chicago. Uh, been around for, what, 30, 40 years up in Evanston. Um, uh, one of the oldest barbecue joints in Illinois, uh, beloved, uh, uh, had a tremendous impact, influence, charity, um, pillar of the community. Yep. Um, but he had one restaurant, and the barbecue was okay. wasn't great. Um, does he make the Hall of Fame? Um, they have this now. One of the things they did this year that I think was significantly important and improvement was they added the legacy category. Yep, right. So they inducted three living members and two deceased. And um, uh, so they they inducted um, James uh, Lemon. A, a couple of important people who are gone. I don't know. I don't know how. I mean, I suppose we could sit down and make a list, but it's not going to go on forever. I don't know that it is. I think uh, I, I would like to see them induct more than three because I think there are a lot of deserving people out there. But uh, I, I think they're on a good flight path. All right, Meathead joining us here on the show. So we have Father's Day coming up, and certainly yeah. there's nobody better to talk to about cool gadgets. In fact, while it's not I'll a uh, – it, it was my Chargon all right. against your – This is my grill floss. Uh, grill floss, so you can see it right there. And then yeah, we'll and, uh, and tight got, shot to you. I got a competitor yeah. for it. I have one of those too, by I, the way. I, I, have a, I have a grill floss, and I like it a lot. Uh, it's very easy to reach. The, the key here is if you're cleaning your grill and your grates, you want to clean both the top and bottom. Yep. Uh, obviously, the top, which is in contact with the food, you don't want a lot of grease there, and you don't want a lot of carbon there because the carbon will make the food stick. But grease gets on the underside, and a lot of people, they fire up their grill, whether it's a gas grill or a smoker, and there's big clouds of smoke. And a lot of it is really just the grease burning yes, off. Right. Grease smoke is not as good tasting as wood smoke, believe me. Um, you don't want that grease underneath. And so the grill floss and the chargon, this is a competitor for the grill floss. I like the chargon a little better. I have both. I use them both. Hmm. Um, but it, basically, you can see it's got this little C shape, and that allows it to scrape both top and bottom. The downside of it is 
is it's one wire, right? Two wire, three wire. So you're standing there scraping and scraping. You know, the wire bristle brush still is so convenient and easy. And I get where people are going when they say ban the bristle brush um, because it's a potential hazard. If you watch what you're doing, and if you care, if you buy a good one, and if you watch what you're doing and you're careful, it's not such a hazard. But that means an awful lot of people who don't watch what they're doing, don't know what they're doing, don't know about the hazard, yeah. can get sick. Do you think that there is a, a time when that particular accessory will be banned, or enough people and or manufacturers or big real companies would say, you know what, you people should stop making that, and uh, we're going to poo-poo on you until that happens? Or do you think that most people uh, think it's a good idea, but in the end they'll go buy a $4 grill brush and take the risk? Because it's cheap, I and think we're lazy. That they'll be banned the day after they ban cigarettes. Oh, great. So they're never going to get banned. Uh -oh. <laughs> wow. Cigarettes are delicious. I mean, doesn't everybody love cigarettes? There, there's, there's an awful lot of <laughs> consumer products out there that are dangerous and risky. Yeah. And the Consumer Product Safety Commission and uh, the, the, the Federal Trade Commission, all these guys on the lookout for them. I don't know. Maybe they will ban them. Um, it, uh, not a lot of people are um, uh, hurt by them. Probably a lot more people are hurt by undercooked chicken. Um, I don't foresee chicken being banned. Um, I don't know. It may be just one of those things we're going to have to educate. Hmm. But I do, you know, I do like these products, and I think that we should do our best to promote them and tell people about the. I think you know, there's an education job to be done. We have to warn people about bristle brushes, and 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 especially the cheap ones. And there, but there are other ones that like the single wire that spun, 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 and you know that's not going to break. Maybe it doesn't last as long, but an easy way to make sure that you don't end up with one in your tongue. Or one yeah. in your small intestine, or sticking out of your colon, or wherever the else it might. Yeah, happen. yeah. yeah. Right. I got one of the. I, you know, I got a couple. They all sent them to me. Sure, and, and I, I've got one of each. Yeah. And frankly, the the ones I like the best are the good old fashioned bristle brushes, um, uh, but they're really well built. They're anchored. The ones that are in a molded plastic, they have a scraper on top, and you know I can just go, <laughs> and that top of my grill grates are all clean yeah. flip them over the underside's all clean and i'm up and running um the other thing i do and this is this is a good move a lot of people don't is i have a roll of paper towels um nearby and i'll take a roll of paper towels fold them up and lay them on top of the grill grate and put that brush on top and push the paper towels across because huh. no matter how much you scrape with that bristle brush there's still grease left behind. Yep. Grease doesn't taste good. Get rid of it. Use I, I always run a paper towel across the surface. All right. What other cool gifts do you have for Father's Day coming up that you want to tell us about? Well, you know, you you know, you said to me you wanted to talk about gifts for Father's Day, and you you immediately cut me off at the knees. You said no thermometers. Well, um, I mean, but we know about that. That's Christmas. We talk about thermometers, and Labor Day. We yeah, talk but about it, thermometers. It, it, but so I, I'm just I I have to raise it again because there's just a lot of macho guys out there who say I don't need no stinking thermometers. And or they like to slice open their steaks and look at the color, Ooh. which you can't tell from. You you you, you just need, and, and well, I mean, if you we're talking about gifts, so give it to right. your uncle or your buddy who doesn't know about thermometers, because no single thing will make you a better cook faster than a good thermometer, right. and that would be a meat thermometer or an oven thermometer or one that does both. And um, so th th that would always be my first choice. There's a lot of other fun things. Like I have those really heavy-duty welder's gloves, the le leather chamois. Yes. And t just tonight I had to use them. I, um, I was doing some Cornish game hen halves, and uh, they, uh, they were – the skin was beautiful and golden, and the, uh, the interior temp was still 15, 20 degrees low. Hmm. And I just wasn't going to bring them in because undercooked chicken is hazardous. But I didn't want them down near the fire where the skin and the underside would continue to blacken. So I pulled them up and put them on the overhead rack. But, damn it, the overhead rack was really up high, and it was hitting the um, uh, rotisserie burner. Yep. So I got those, and it was hot in that grill. 
I got those leather welder chamois gloves and reached in there and grabbed, and this was a thick, heavy-duty stainless steel grate, and picked it up and dropped it into a lower position. Never felt the heat at all. Wow. Man, those things, you can pick up briquettes. You can pick up logs. Um, uh, they are just fantastic. I have two pair, one of which is filthy, and I use it for filthy things, and the other would, the other pair of which are fairly clean. And, you know, every now and then when they get really disgusting, I just walk inside, go to the kitchen sink, pump some um, dishwasher liquid on it or dish liquid on it and just wash them like I would wash my huh. hands. Um, uh, those things are fantastic, yeah. and uh, they're not terribly expensive, and they're, they make great gifts. They sure do. Uh, we're talking with Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. All right, uh, hang on one second here, Meathead, while we talk about Southside Market and barbecue, and then we'll come back and finish up with some of the Father's Day gifts and all the other cool stuff that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, as I had mentioned, Southside Market, right? The oldest barbecue joint in Texas since 1882. They've been owned and operated by the same family for three generations, offering premium Central Texas barbecue products, slow-smoked over real wood, shipping, distributing, and manufacturing sausages for companies across the U.S., from food truck services to multi-chain restaurants. Southside Sausage can be on your menu as well. All meats are processed in the on-site USDA inspected facility. They're a trusted partner with a focus on quality and authenticity. Wholesale options are available. They ship nationwide via FedEx and use food service distribution channels like Cisco, U.S. Foods, and Martin Foods. Co-packaging capable from research and development to package completion. They can follow your recipe or help you develop something brand spanking new. They also have private label opportunities available as well. So if you really like their jalapeno cheddar sausage or their sausage slammers, or their beef sausage, and you have a food truck, or you're looking to add something to your products chain, you can get in touch with Southside and say, hey, can I sell your sausage but with my logo on? Well, that's what private labeling is. It's your logo. You're passing it off as yours, but it's something that's tried and true because it's a Southside Market product. Everybody's winning. You visit southsidemarket.com for more information or to order. And if you're going to order and you want to save 10% off each and every order when you go there, BBQ Central is the code to use. That's all one word, lowercase. BBQ Central, and that gets you 10% off your entire online order. This time, next time, all the time. Tell all your friends, too, because it works for them. No special other codes or anything. Just BBQ Central for 10% off. Meathead from AmazingRibs.com continues. Stick around. We'll be right back. Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. All right, uh, Cooking Pellets is bringing you this segment. So if you're looking for great quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers, you go over to cookingpellets.com and purchase there. Great flavors. And the straight information on wood pellets. If you ever have any questions, just email Chris Becker. He'll answer everything for you honestly and truthfully. Amazon.com sells them as well. All right, Meathead, thanks for hanging with me through the break. Did you have something to say? I got a like more you... I can throw out there if you want to play the um, I do. Father's Day gift guide. You're damn right. Let's go. All right. Here, this is a fun one. Um, there's, there's a pair of tongs out there that I stumbled into on Amazon. Uh, there, uh, the handles may be uh, 12 inches long, but the end of them are, oh, I don't know how to describe them. They look like a platypus bill. Um, they have a, a, a flipper <clears throat> that basically they're big enough to completely engulf a hamburger or a fillet of fish. Wow. <clears throat> so, and fish in particular, you know how that falls apart. Yeah, um, and most spatulas. So it's basically tongs with two spatulas on either side that you can clamp down on a fish or a burger and flip. They're stainless steel. Um, I, I don't remember the manufacturer. Just go to AmazingRibs.com and look up burger flippers. They're very inexpensive, mm. and they really work great for burgers and uh, and, and fish. I'm really fond of those guys. Um, Something else I think is pretty uh, cool idea is there is 
an outfit, I think they're out of Florida, that makes a hinge kit for Weber Kettles and Weber Smoky Mountains. Unknown Barbecue is the name of the company that makes it. Say again? Unknown Barbecue. Unknown Barbecue. Yep. Um, well, they're not unknown. They're they make these hinges <laughs> are really well designed yes. and well built, um, and uh, you, you know you you've got to put a couple of holes in the lid and the, the unit, but uh, you won't regret it because it just paying with both devices that you can't hinge the lids. Um, and the cool thing is they have a cotter pin, um, so you can pull the pin and you can remove the hood yep. if you want to. Um, and they're, they're not, they're not cheap. They're like 70 bucks or something, but they're really built to last. And re- it really makes both, um, the, um, the Weber kettle and the uh, Weber Smoky mountain a, a lot, a lot. E- the, the problem is, is the cover from my Weber Smoky mountain. Yeah. I can't fit it over there anymore because the hinge sticks out so far. I had to buy a new cover. They also but, uh, uh, make it so for the folks that have pit barrel cookers, they make one that would fit oh, yeah? a pit barrel cook. Anything that pretty much has a lid anymore, they make them for Weber kettles and the Weber Smoky Mountains and the pit barrel cookers. Uh, and know. look, I'm I'm as unhandy as it comes. I think it's been well proven during the life <laughs> of this show. I put the holes in my pit barrel cooker. I follow the directions that were very easy, and that thing made all the difference. I, I mean, certainly it's not necessarily uh, that big of a pain to take the top of the pit barrel off and hang it on the horseshoe handle that's on the pit barrel, but just to lift it up, boom, and it locks in place. You don't have to worry about it. Yep. Then lift it yep. back up, put it right in place. It is a, it's a great 70 bucks, and uh, again, for a, a, a gift, uh, it's pretty cheap, and the efficiency and effectiveness that it delivers is second to none. Um, here, here's another one. When, uh, as long as we're talking about Weber Kettle, um, I mean, it's not unknown. I'm major. I would wager most of your audience has heard of the Slowens here, but it's a insert for the um, Weber Kettle, um, and um, what it does is corrals all your charcoal into a small area, and then there's a water dam between your charcoal and the rest of the um, the the the, uh, the cooker space. And um, it really helps you set up a two-zone. Now, you can do this with a couple of bricks, but it's not as good. Um, And that water dam is one of the secrets. Water, of course, is a really good way to buffer heat. But moisture in the atmosphere condenses on cold meat. And, um, And even if your meat is warming, it's not as hot as the air inside. If you're cooking at 225 and up, your meat is not 225, I guarantee. Um, So the water will condense on the meat. That cools the meat, slows the cooking, um, adds a little bit of moisture. But just as important is that smoke particles stick to wet surfaces. So you've got a, a device that pushes all the charcoal off to one side, makes your Weber kettle into a really good two zone smoker. And it also raises the charcoal up. So if you want to sear something, you can lay the charcoal right over that. I mean, lay the meat right over that charcoal, which is just below the meat, and get an unbelievable sear on a steak or a burger or a chop. So that's why they call it slow and sear. Um, And they make a bunch of other accessories. They make a rack that sits on top of the grate that's a nice thing. Uh, they make a, a drip pan. The, the slow and sear people have got it going. All right. Anything else for Father's Day, or is that a good enough list to get people going? Well, one more item I'll throw out right, there, just ahead. on the high end. Oh. If if you want to spend three hundred, three hundred fifty bucks, um, something that's really hot right now in um, the big box hardware stores and in Walmart is flat top griddles. Yeah. Um, flat top griddles are flying out the door. I've heard some confidential numbers from Blackstone, who's the leader in the game, yep. and there's bazillions of them um, flying out the door. At 300 bucks, um, these things work. They, um, they let you cook like you would see a short order cook in Joe's, uh, Joe's Grill. Um, you can do your scrambled eggs, your... Um, pancakes, your French fries, your caramelized onions, 
um, uh, home fries, everything, uh, shrimp, uh, scallops, uh, whatever you want to see a steak, and they get darn hot. And you have the, the better ones have um, pretty good propane control, and it's just a flat um, metal surface. It's not cast iron, um, uh, but uh, um, it, it really works, and um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, there, uh, there are some smaller ones that are great for camping, but um, if you are into the outdoor cooking and you've got a gas grill, you got a charcoal grill, you got a smoker, now you need a grill. All right. So that's uh, in the three hundred and fifty dollar range. You said. I think it's three twenty nine, something like that. Up around there. All right. Uh, so check that out as well. Uh, I'm sure most of the stuff is listed over at Meathead's website as well. Meathead. Is at AmazingRibs.com. Uh, that's the website. Let, yeah, go ahead. Let me just point out. You say listed over at our website. I just want to point out to anybody who's listening is not familiar. We test, we review, we rate, we link to where to buy it, but we don't sell anything. Right. You're not a retailer. No, we don't right. sell anything except membership in our Pitmaster Club. Otherwise, uh, I don't even sell my own book. you got to go to Amazon to get it. There you go. Uh, Which, right there. I see it right over your right shoulder. That's a bestseller, from what I understand. One of the best books ever written. Top ten books ever written, right? Or something Thank like you. that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about this evening, I'm going to be having John Marcus on here in uh, just a few short minutes. So I think we uh, both widely agree that he is somebody that has exposed uh, many millions of people into, uh, or at least inspiring them into getting into some form or fashion of the live fire grilling industry. And uh, tonight, I don't know if you were aware, but there was a first attempt at a pay-per-view barbecue contest. Did you know anything about this? I know, well, I just found out about it and flipping through Twitter today. I saw Ray Lampy's site and I saw yeah. our Twitter feed and a couple of others talking about this fight club. And then when I logged in, your listeners were talking about it in the comments. And I'm still not clear as to what it's all about. Um, I'm interested in hearing more. It sounds like it's a competition pay-per-view. Very interesting concept. I don't know how many people are willing to pay to watch a competition barbecue, but if they show us a little more than what your typical TV show is showing us, it might be worthwhile. And, hey, listen, you mentioned John. Um, I'm a huge fan of John Marcus. I met him when the first pitmasters uh came on tv i was doing a weekly review for the huffington post i reviewed every week um they were great fun um and john is one of the most remarkable people in the barbecue community he is truly a man for all seasons erudite um well-read did you know he's a playwright did i know um, of course i know he wrote the fabulous lipitones you know. for crying out loud yeah, the li I actually purchased a script to the Lipitones, which you can read in 45 minutes. Um, it's a fun, fun play. Um, uh, he's written a couple of other plays. I, I, you know, uh, people who know of him know that he was he won an Emmy for uh, uh, his job as a writer on the Bill Cosby Show. Um, and uh, you, uh, just you know, do you know one he of was co-creator was of not monodimensional. He was co-creator of a different world. Do you remember that? That was a spinoff of the Cosby mm -hmm. show that was wildly successful with the Lisa Bonet, mm -hmm. uh, I think Marissa Tomei, uh, and a younger Teresa, uh, Marissa Tomei was in that as well. I mean, that's a big deal. Just those two things oh, alone yeah. no, are huge. He's he's very very knowledgeable, very experienced, yeah. um, and um, his expertise goes way beyond barbecue into all matters, food, literature, um, uh, truly um, unlike anybody else I know in the barbecue world. Yeah. Um, so to get back to the Fight Club, so it was a $9.99 get down for this evening. Now, yesterday, to entice you at 6 p.m. Eastern, they had a, a let's call it round table outside in some secret undisclosed location. I know exactly where it is, by the way. But uh, they had <laughs> uh, they had uh, the guy from uh, Smoking Hogs, Massachusetts, uh, Bill Gillespie, uh, the pitmaster from Nine One Three Barbecue, Darren Worth is uh, competing. Of course, Tim Shear is over there. Uh, uh, Luke Darnell from Old Virginia Smoke, uh, Kelly Wirtz from 
Four Legs Up Barbecue. I believe that was uh, rounding out the competition. So they had these six folks going up against each other. And uh, what I'm trying to ascertain is how much was shown. I mean, uh, look, I'm no idiot here. I know how a barbecue competition runs. And if you're starting out from the beginning, which I doubt they were, I mean, what are we looking at at a minimum time commitment of five hours or six hours? So there's no way they showed a barbecue competition starting at 6 o'clock tonight, and uh, it's already over. So th- there had to have been some or, or a bunch of pre-recorded stuff, or maybe they were cooking during the day today, and they were making packages and then filtering in some live stuff at 6 o'clock. I'm not sure exactly how it worked. Because I can't, as much as I like it, because your guy, uh, Dane Neal, over there in Chicago, was one of the big operating uh, partners in this. So he, I think he put the deal together with Fight TV in order to get this off the ground, because he's into motorsports, too, and that's part of the show that he has over there on WGN. And when he was on last week talking about it, I, I, I thought I dug the concept. But what I keep going back to, and back me up on this, Mita, barbecue people are inherently cheap bastards. And for them to <laughs> squeeze $10 out for something that they don't perceive what would be $200 worth of value, I mean, that's a hard sell. And then it's competition barbecue on top of it. Five years ago, six years ago, I could see it being a little bit more general public fascinating. But in 2020, and I get that still a lot of people are trapped and there's – yearnings for every kind of entertainment to keep us uh keep the idle hands going but i don't know if i saw you know more than a few people paying some money i mean i want to know what the business ends up being here well let me let me reflect upon what little i know yes um uh there is a there's probably five thousand people in this country who are really into barbecue competition yeah so my instincts are is that would be their corner, their core market, because I mean now I don't compete and I don't judge anymore because I just don't like sitting in a tent for a whole day. Um, but um, I do go to a competition every now and then, and when I do, I know some of the cooks and I like to visit with them, and they trust me. They know I'm not going to share all their secrets and blow their cover right. and and I get to taste some of the food. Now you mentioned Darren Worth and I he was nominated this year for the hall. Darren is the single best competition cook I've encountered. I've tasted all of his meats for KCBS competition more than one year and they're just unbelievable. There's nothing there that comes anywhere close nothing I cook comes anywhere close to what he cooks. Yeah. Um, now, if I knew I could watch this show and get his secrets, I'd pay nine ninety five. Hmm. Um, but I don't know if he'd be willing to do that because as much as he and I, we get along. He and I and his wife Sherry, um, I you know I bring them wine. I brought her flowers last time I saw her. Um, we sit around, we share drinks, and there are some things that he just hasn't shown me yet. And I haven't asked to be allowed to see them. Um, I, you know, I don't know if that's going to be it. Now, if I knew that the deep, dark secrets yeah. are going to be revealed, I'm in for nine ninety five. Whether they're doing that or not, I don't know. I'll say this. It's interesting. I didn't hear about it at all until yesterday. I know Dane Neal. I've been a guest on his show here in Chicago, WGN. I know most of the cooks you've mentioned. If I'm trying to promote a pay-per-view show for ten bucks, yeah, the first thing I would do would ask Meathead to promote it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, for Christ's sake, we just the Barbecue Stars series, which sold for two hundred ninety-seven dollars, we promoted it and sold six or eight hundred tickets yeah. at three hundred bucks. Wow. So if they had come to me and said, "Would you?" You know, here's what's all involved. I don't have to be invited. I don't have to cook. I don't have to observe. But at least, you know, say something about it on your site and social media. I probably could have sold a bunch of tickets for them. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll be interested to see also uh, what the thought was on the actual technical side of things. And, and maybe people are a lot more forgiving. But 
uh, it, it is internet based. Uh, I know where they were, and I'm not necessarily thinking that there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure out there, but maybe I'm wrong. And uh, you know, audio, video, and and how did it work to and te- uh, to enhance or detract from a ten dollar buying experience? Uh, uh, I guess all will be revealed Production here over values. next week. Yeah, got to have. You know, I mean, you have taken this show and fine-tuned the production value. You talked earlier in the show about the quality of audio. I mean, you've got production values down pat with the exception of your blue-fringed hair. Um, (laughs) I work hard on that, by the way. I know. I know. You're going to have to start dyeing it. (laughs) But um, the production values are crucial. Um, we don't do a lot of video at AmazingRibs.com because I just won't do crapola handheld camera videos. Yeah. Um, if that's what this show is, then it's certainly not going to fly. They have got to do what – I mean, if they didn't get John Marcus involved in, in, in doing it, they missed an opportunity because he knows production values. So I don't know who's directing and producing and what's going on. It would be interesting to find out. Um, uh, I, now that I know a little more about it, I might go out and spend 10 bucks and try to watch it. All right. So we'll see how it goes. In the meantime, you can find Meathead on the second Tuesday of the month right here in the first hour and every other minute after that at AmazingRibs.com. Meathead, always appreciate the time, and we will look for you again in July. And good night to you and Central Lights, and uh, we'll see you in a month. All right. Uh, happy Father's Day, everyone. All right. There is Meathead right there. From AmazingRibs.com, of course. Everybody's loving Meathead. And let's see. I think we can do this. We'll be back to wrap up the show this first hour after I tell you about Pits and Spits, the newest sponsor of the show since 1983. Handcrafting smokers and grills in Houston, Texas. Established itself as one of the premier brands and high-quality offsets and more recently pellet cookers. Set themselves apart by using heavy 7 and 10 gauge steel in every cooker, fully welded construction that you can feel when you use the unit. And the 304 stainless roll top lid and front shelf on every single cooker. So why does it matter? Well, by using higher quality materials, pits and spits smokers reach and maintain temperatures, allowing you to worry more about the meat than the heat. They provide fully welded smokers, so you don't have to worry about grease and smoke leaking out of the barrel. Or about the grill rattling apart as you move it through the yard when you move it around, because you know you're going to do that. And by using the 304 stainless steel, you're getting a heirloom quality product that will be able to be passed down to your kids. Now, where some companies are focusing on low-cost providership, Pits and Spits focuses on craftsmanship and using quality materials. Are they cheaper ways of manufacturing products? Sure. But they don't tack well. Cheap, cha- uh, cheap stainless, electronics that you can't trust. They're not about that. Having in-house manufacturing gives them complete control of the design and standards. That's not something you find in products that are brought in from overseas. Steel suppliers supply materials to be used in some of the harshest environments around, so they perform in any condition anywhere. And the controllers are made right here in the United States, so they're able to use impeded transparency into the program. Pits and Spits, uh, Pits and Spits has a dealer network across the country, but there isn't one close to you. Feel free to give them a call at the shop, 844-650-6250. Whether you're a backyard grill master looking to cook steaks for the family or a competition team smoking 50 racks of ribs, Pits and Spits has product for you. You can also check their grills out in the wild across social media at Pits and Spits or look on the website, Pits and Spits. That's P-I-T-T-S-A-N-D-S-P-I-T-T-S, pitsandspits.com. We're back to wrap the first hour right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, welcome back. We are wrapping the first hour. I'll catch up with a little bit of business here after we scoot through the top of the hour open. Thanks again to Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. Make sure you're checking it out over there if you have never been. Most of us have, AmazingRibs.com. We'll step away here as we point to the second hour. John Marcus coming up. Dave Bosca after that. 
We'll talk about a few other things as we get to the 10 o'clock hour. Stick around. We'll be right back. board here for the really big barbecue show Boing. we cook because we have to and we grill because we want to hit me fine how you want <laughs> you have a great show i'm a big fan Boing. so what 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 seems to be the problem here this man looks like he's dead and he's in the in the crackle sean bono it's all about the sean bono dude Succulent fish. What? He ate two feet for wiener. Come here, Lavernius. Shut your face. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seed. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. All right, welcome into the second hour. It's the Barbecue Central Show. Here we go. If you missed the first hour, you missed a whole bunch of meathead. We talked about Father's Day gifts that are coming up that you're going to want to consider, and time is starting to run out, so don't wait. Amazon completely overwhelmed still. Although they're doing better, i got to be honest. I'm not going to the stores to shop. I'll shop on Amazon. That's coming pretty quickly now. We also talked about his missing of the 2020 Barbecue Hall of Fame and how we thought this might be his year. He was a repeat semifinalist, but that only worked for two-thirds, not all three of the returning nominees. Aaron Franklin and Desiree were also returns, and they both got in, not Mita. And then we also finished it out talking a little pay-per-view barbecue. Uh, Dennis Busso, by the way, the... Colorado embedded correspondent did get down for the $9.99 and scanning through some of these uh, very quickly following most of the chat from the show, which I let yesterday during the free preview, there was a chat box while you were watching. So you could chat with other people watching. So I assume that's what he's talking about. Following most of the chat for the show, people were upset that it wasn't live, it was recorded, and they didn't get the the behind-the-scenes action they were looking for. It was all pre-recorded, turned out to be a two-hour show, so from 6 to 8 Eastern. And, I mean, I don't... Where's the expectation? I would imagine that the expectation of a pay-per-view event isn't that you're going to be watching something taped Although, when you watch a movie or some kind of a show on demand, uh, technically that's pay-per-view. Now, you know that a movie has already been produced and it's not something that's going to happen live, but a barbecue contest, a fight club, if you will, these events are typically something that you experience live, so there might be an expectation that you're going to see a live event, not something that took place earlier in the day that they were shooting, and then packaged together to give you a finished, produced product for two hours. That's what at least sounds like from Dennis, who was watching the chat during the show. And as I had said before, uh, Dennis will buy anything and everything barbecue-related, even if it sucks. Even if he thinks before he hits the buy button, this thing is a loser's loser, he's still going to pay money for it. He supports the industry second to none. Few rival Dennis's support. The guy has been to Barbecue University. What is it, Dennis? Like five years in a row? I mean, you should be Stephen Reichland's favorite class person. Uh, that would be student <laughs> otherwise. I didn't make it very far in school, ladies and gentlemen. You should be Stephen Reichland's best student ever. He should recognize you every time. Here's my star pupil, Dennis from Colorado. He's traveled around the 
lower 48 with me as we have had this. So, that's some initial feedback from a guy that watched it saying that there were some technical issues, there were some audio issues, there were some video issues, but the bigger gripe was that it was all pre-recorded and done in a two-hour show where the expectation was that it was going to be a live show. So we'll see how it goes from there. I'll be interested to follow up with Dane and see what the actual numbers were and if he's getting any heat from that. Still to come on this show this evening, John Marcus in about 10 minutes. And Dave Bosco from Butcher Barbecue helping me close it out. Don't forget, you can follow me socially at BBQ Central Show on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok. Episode 128 is coming up this Friday on the best moments of the Barbecue Central Show in 10 minutes or less. So make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast in order to hear that if you're not already. This one takes you back all the way to June 2nd, 2015, so about five years from now. And I was joined by Ray Lampy, Dr. Barbecue, who was in an undisclosed location. Am I allowed to say it now? I mean, like the show's over. Am I allowed to get on and uh, start dumping on it immediately? Is that okay? Am I allowed to do that? I don't want to burn any bridges. Ray Lampy was on the show back in June of 2015, and we talked about the year he got into the Barbecue Hall of Fame. That's right. We also talked about burgers, one of my favorite things to eat. Burgers, one of my favorite things to talk about. Burgers. Who doesn't love burgers? We also talked about some other items as well. So as I had mentioned before, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Even if you're a live viewer, you're not going to get the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in 20 minutes or less here in this show. You have to subscribe to the podcast in order to get that special content that John Solberg provides you each and every Friday, first thing in the morning, so you can start your weekend off the right way. And by the way, let me talk about burgers for a second. And I'm not going to sit here and listen to you people tell me what a douche I am for eating Bubba Burgers. No. They don't send me free products. No. They're not paying me for anything. As much as you don't want to believe it, because, oh, every burger apparently is a Bubba Burger. Man. I'm a big fan of the product, period. I'm a big fan. I know how to cook them. It's as easy as it gets. And, oh, by the way, they are delicious. They're also, from a burger standpoint, pretty forgiving. They will stay somewhat juicy even if you go over a bit. The last hamburger shot that I gave you that many of you summarily took a dump on and roundly criticized me for using free for frozen patties. I went over a little bit. You pointed it out. A lot of you did. A little over for me. Nobody's asking for you. I mean, a little over for me, too. I got busy doing it. But if you look at the picture, get over the color of the meat on the inside and still see how juicy and succulent that meat was. As the cheese was bleeding from the bottom, middle, and top with some fresh dill pickles, some mayo, what are the mustard, mustard A's, mayo turd. I don't know. It's the mayonnaise and the mustard all mixed into one squeeze bottle, whatever the hell they call it. However, getting back to my point, $2 a patty, six in a box. What's not to love? I make my own sometimes. I have a Lemberger press that John Solberg told me to get. I enjoy using it, but I'll be damned if the burger I make with that ground beef in the press is any better than the Bubba. In fact, I might make an argument that the Bubba burger is still better. So bring all the hate you want, but I am inclined to believe that your hate is derived from ignorance. You've never had the gloriousness of a Bubba burger. So your first take is to hate on it, don't hate, appreciate the Bubba Burger. And if you've tried them before and you don't like it and you think I'm a legit kook, fine. Trust your palate 
But guess what? More for me. They're delicious. I turn the Weber on, medium heat. That gets me somewhere in the neighborhood of 425 to 450. Flat top side of the grill grates, frozen patty on. Come back in four minutes, flip, do it for four minutes at three and a half minutes of the four, put the cheese on top, and we're done. It's an eight minute cook, eight and a half minute cook. That's it. They're juicy, a little bit of pink in the middle. God, they taste good. But I'm done hearing about how your handmade patties from your freshly ground beef shanks, whatever the hell it is you use, is so much better. Pre four patties, Bubba Burger, frozen. F you, they're great. And I stand by the fact that most of you are hating on me because you've Haven't had them before. Try them first. If you've had them before and you hate them, whatever. This isn't a you're wrong, I'm right, but you're wrong and I'm right. Last week I was telling you if you wanted to own a piece of barbecue history, the Barbecue Central Show studio is up for sale. Well, a week later I'm here to tell you it is not for sale. It is off the market, and we are in contract on both sides, this house and the new house. We're on contract both sides. Five days, 20 grand over asking. Suck it. That's right. By the way, people getting down on this house, very nice people. They're currently my two favorite people in the world. I'm even I'm even leaving them what I'm about to read you. A Green Mountain Grill. What a nice guy I am. Here's a housewarming gift. One of my favorite pellet cookers with a pizza oven insert. Uh, you go to GreenMountainGrills.com for all the information. There's a choice line and a prime line. Choice line. Doesn't have all the tech. Maybe you don't want all the tech. I'm not necessarily a tech fan. I don't need it not going to sway me one way or the other if it has it because i'm probably not going to use it that's just me you might be different you might want tech out the wazoo then you're going to want to look at the prime line you got the wi-fi technology you have two internal meat probes you have peek in windows on the main cooking chamber on the pellet hopper you have a more robust chassis build on the cooker for the prime but if you want to save a couple bucks nothing wrong with the choice line still the same amount of space Still the same model types, Jim Bowie, Daniel Boone. And either line accommodates that pizza oven insert that I just mentioned. If you want something that you can take on tailgates, it appears we're reopening. Tailgating is going to be happening. Sports are going on. I saw a baseball tournament happening two blocks from me at the city park. All day Saturday, all day Sunday. Bring your Davy Crockett with you because if you don't have access to a traditional power outlet, just plug it into your car. Or use the battery taps that it has. It'll cook a lot of food. Believe me, you're not sacrificing a ton of quantity for its travelability. Is that a word? I doubt it. GreenMountainGrills.com is the website. Check out all the accessory sauces and rubs as well. Plus pellets. Yes, that's right. And we're back with John Marcus. Stick around. Be right back. Visits from a killer hog, a cooking guy, a man named Meathead, the author of Barbecue Bible, a grill girl, a bristly barbecue journalist, and the male feasance of the barbecue world known as the embedded correspondence. Only found right here on the Barbecue Central Show. And this portion of the show being brought to you by Pit Barrel Cooker, the most unbelievable outdoor cooking device on the planet. Currently available in two sizes. Whether you're a beginner or professional, this cooker, definitely one you want to add to the arsenal. Visit pitbarrelcooker.com to tell 
uh, or tell them that the Barbecue Central show sent you, of course. Lifestyle Room just announced. My next guest brought barbecue to the small screen, and I guess big screen to a certain degree, and in doing so exposed a whole generation of ladies and gentlemen to the world of live fire competition, barbecue cooking, or just live fire in general. He was on the 2020 Barbecue Hall of Fame semifinal list of names, and little known fact, born a Buckeye, but now residing in New York City and points north and east. We welcome back one of the most accomplished writing minds of all time. Just my opinion, of course, but many would back me in such a opinion. John Marcus rejoins the show. Hey, John. Great. Great to be here. How are we doing technically? Am, am I up to the level of speed that you normally have here? Uh, I mean, everything is, uh, I mean, you know, are, are we going to break it down to say lighting and, you know, all this other stuff? I mean, come on, what are we doing? We're not uh, shooting television here. We're really shooting for really high quality audio, which is how the show is mostly consumed. So the fact that you've even made time at this hour is uh, just enough for me. I, everything else is gr- cream on the coffee is my Dutch boss used to say back in the day. Um, I have a lot of available time during this sheltering in period, and I wouldn't spend it anywhere but with you. I like, by the way, I just want to compliment you on how well you're lit. And I kind of am feeling like I'm away on a, like at a fishing lodge when I'm talking to you. I feel like maybe I've caught you in between scenes shooting Ozark or something like that. Well, uh, let's say that's what I'm shooting. Okay. Well, that's, uh, it's my newest, uh, I mean, it's not even a guilty pleasure. It's just the show that we happen to be semi binging one or two episodes. I mean, uh, look, I, I'm not uh, immediately, I'm going to diverge from topic, but as I watch uh, streaming television now, because it's, uh, not anything like network television used to be. Nobody knows that better than you. And here I'm watching the show. I mean, Jason Bateman has been on television for, what, 750 years? I remember when he was on Silver Spoons. Now he's uh, this guy on Ozark, and he has had many successful uh, jaunts through, I think it was Arrested Development before this, a number of things uh, here and there, uh, successful sister, obviously. But I'm watching this show, and when we get through one episode, I look at my wife, I'm like, damn. That seemed like it was really long, like a legitimate hour, and there's no ads. Is streaming something that you ever foresaw coming to the stage in this way? I mean, it has really kind of taken over the way we watch anything. I I think that uh, it was beginning to grow on uh, on Americans and on the world because basically what used to exist was appointment television. That's the old days. And, you know, when I started in TV, makes me sound a bit like grandpa to say that. That's why I'm wearing a kind of a hipper face scarf. Very here. nice. And uh, uh, this d- doubles as like a COVID tool. Yes. If I need it. So, but, but uh, otherwise, I look like I could be hanging out in Soho. <laughs> well, in case you were wondering, too, uh, because you can't tell distance side by side, we are six feet away from each other. <laughs> no problem. Um, I only wish I was six feet away from you. That would be back in my Buckeye home state, That's which right. is kind of behind me what I have a tribute to here, which is the uh, the decal sign. Yes, decal, yeah, yeah. That's right, and that's sort of – I grew up with those signs in the cornfields around me, and I was able to find one of them, and I have it nailed up to my wall here, upstate New York, and it's very nostalgic to me. Yeah, so – I wanted to have you on because the you didn't answer uh, your streaming question. Oh no. yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm rushing no, that's through. Okay, no. I'm 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 the person that always can return us to the conversation because Greg, really, I just assume we could go for an hour, you and me, can't oh, we? I mean, easily an hour. I think we proved that <laughs> when we uh, joined each other in person at Katz's Deli uh, this past September, which was, you know, for me. Uh, one of my most treasured memories, uh, certainly getting married, birth of my kids. But outside of that, uh, I don't know if there has been anything more joyful to me to have somebody who I had met online through barbecue, talking about barbecue television, and then to be in the concrete jungle of New York City where dreams are made to have a pastrami sandwich with John Marcus in person, absolutely blew my mind. Uh, still cloud nine for me. It was an absolute fabulous experience, and I appreciate you taking the time to meet me. 
I had such a good time that I want you to know I have not been back to Katz's since. We have broken the mold on Katz. <laughs> I'm, I'd go with you at special occasion. If I, you know, uh, you you uh, are a, a very, uh, you're on a very short list of barbecue friends, Greg. So I would, you know, you. it would be, it's a great pleasure to have, to have gone with you there. We had fun. Uh, but uh, basically, quickly about streaming. Yes. Yep. We we when appointment television went out of the way, when people began to have what they wanted in life, which was their own schedules. They didn't they don't want people to tell them when to be in front of the television set, which really gave traction to streaming in the beginning. But now, of course, this whole what we've gone through as a culture has really turned us into uh, people that want to just stay in or have to stay in and watch. It's a hard you run out of things to do unless you get to sit down and let somebody do the work for you, which is what television does. It does the work for you. I was wondering that at this stage, if streaming is this popular from a television standpoint, that this would also be the momentum gain where podcasts, because if you think about it, uh, podcasting has been around long before streaming television has been around, but yet it still seems to be something that's new or people are just finding out about it. Well, meanwhile, streaming television has become so accepted. I have to figure at this point, podcasting is going to a snowball even in more success due to the uh, wide acceptance of streaming television, or at least that's my hope. Uh, I think, you know, it's a content-driven business. I think that you have a compelling show, and if somebody is at all remotely interested in the topic, they're going to want to sit down with you and hear the show. So it's, again, you know, uh, we're all about the the niches of society now. I not, never know whether to say niches or niches, but but it's one of those two. And and special interest. They just, the, gone are the days of having to have huge audiences. But I right. mean, I'm assuming. Uh, I I don't know the size of your audience, but I'm assuming it grows constantly because of the interest in this matter. And you you are out front, my friend. You've been there for a long time. Yeah, we're going on 12 years uh, just this past February, so we're uh, keeping doing it live now for a, a dozen years, if you can believe it or not. Does, doesn't that make you among the first of podcasters? Yeah, I mean it's it's. I don't think I'm uh, that. Uh, what, oh. Who was that DJ that was credited with like the first podcast? Adam somebody or other. Adam Curry, I think, was the first podcaster credited. But certainly, I mean, back in 2006, it was uh, 2007. It was something that nobody was really doing or they were just. To, it was the worst. Basically, it was the worst back then. And thank God uh, advances in technology and, and my want to provide a quality product has never a waiver. So now we sound good. Now we look good. But oh my yeah. God, you know, those first five or 10 were just the worst. And they sounded like, remember the old teleconference thing where you call in for work and, you know, everybody joins together. Well, it sounded like everybody was on a teleconference. You know why? Because everybody was on the telephone and they were just using this recording piece. It was horrible, horrible on every aspect. And I was bad and the questions, it was all bad. But we got better. We practice. We learn to speak. We learn to craft questions. We do research. We prep. We do all this stuff like professionals. And now we are a polished, I say we, me, a polished machine trying to access all of the, uh, like the ESPN of the live fire industry. That's what I tell people when they want that very quick five-second elevator pitch. Uh, well, your show from the very beginning had a certain charm. Uh, I, I personally, I, I miss hearing the boat horn and the audience cheers. Do those not happen anymore? These? <laughs> I oh, was yeah. hoping that would. I, I thought I went for a long time without it, so I was feeling a little insecure. <laughs> but uh, I want to also tell you that I was just, we were just interrupted by a text message from Meathead. Oh, Meathead. Who right. basically accused me of stealing the DeKalb sign. Really? The nerve of yeah. that guy. Wow. And and you know what? I'm going to say basically uh, no comment to that accusation. Yeah. Uh, guess what, John? We don't uh, have party to non-barbecue Hall of Famers. That's what I have to say about <laughs> oh, that. You pound oh, salt, oh. meathead. Get out of here in my conversation. So let's talk about that for a sec. Uh, you, this year you, you make the short list or the semi-finalist of yeah. nine names. 
uh, for the folks that aren't familiar, people have a, a big window of just nominating whoever you want. Those names are held into a big pool, and then at some point, the uh, nominating committee whittle the mass names down to nine, and you make the nine. So where does that uh, fit with you? Like, uh, did you ever have any thought? Had you ever given any thought about the Barbecue Hall of Fame to any degree at any point? Um, I, uh, you know, I've followed it, and I'm I'm friends with many of the inductees, yeah, yeah. and uh, I have always thought it to be a, a really, uh, a, 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 you know, this, the organization has a lot of history and, uh, I just felt it was, uh, I was just happy when I heard that I had made that list and, and I'm happy to this day about it. I still have a glow that was completely when the announcements of who made it came out, my glow didn't change. Honestly, I have a uh, I couldn't believe the names that were sh- that I was sharing the list with. Yeah. So yeah. I, I I I thought about yeah, I'd be dishonest to say like, well, it never occurred to me that I might have a shot at that. That, that would be dishonest. Uh but you know, I I don't come to barbecue uh with the same history that many of the people who've gotten in come to it with. I mean, they've been at it a long time, although uh I was cooking for about three years before barbecue, uh, the all-star barbecue showdown happened before I met Chris Lilly, who, when I was at big Bob Gibson in Decatur, Alabama, doing a radio broadcast from there. And after all the crowds went home, uh, Chris Lilly said to me, uh, we should do an iron chef with barbecue. Mm. You and I should do this. And, and I, that's when I said, you mean, you mean cast iron chef. That's probably what we should call it. <laughs> and um, uh, so I've been cooking for a couple of years at that point. I mean, I had a rotisserie cooker uh, and uh, I was I had learned how to do ribs properly. So I haven't still haven't been at it as long as a lot of these a lot of these folks that, that are getting in. So I think it's, you know, it's it's uh, um, a really important part of the history of what's happening with the KCBS and with uh, with all that, but uh, but but uh, you know, uh, it's just good to be part of that crowd. Is there any convolution or uh, misunderstanding about from? A, I'm asking you to speculate, like maybe on a general public sense of of what the Barbecue Hall of Fame is. Is it competitors? Is it restaurateurs? Is it folks that have contributed in some way outside of those respective divisions? Does there need to be some kind of a more defined role or uh, focus for the hall to have in order to gain more of a grassroots support from general public? Or or perhaps are, are we fooling ourselves in the fact that while we are within the subculture and we have really gone through the layers, uh, most people uh, aren't like us and uh, perhaps don't even care. <laughs> well, I <laughs> listen, when uh, I tell friends who are not part of the barbecue world that I was a nominee, uh, they want to know more <laughs> because barbecue itself comes with this great curiosity. Uh, as As we've talked about before, like I spend a lot of time – in my my city apartment on 72nd Street in Manhattan there. And it's it's a building where there's, uh, I ride up and down in elevators and back in the day, hopefully we're opening back up and I'll be in an elevator one more, once more. But uh, I was stunned at the, uh, that the, at the range of people and the amount of people that are aware of Barbecue Pitmasters mm-hmm. that know the show, because these are city people mostly. And um, there is a great curiosity about the subject, and they find the characters compelling who do this, and the passion, because there's always passion. So that that intrigues people. So um, will it be the same amount of people that say sit down and watch a golf match on television or follow it? I don't know that. But at the same time, I think that the Hall of Fame – because we come to barbecue from so many different directions, the Hall of Fame has to be inclusive of many different kinds of skills 
and contributions, right? So are you there because you started the podcast that, that is really one of the leaders of, in the field and also initiated uh, this, uh, the culture uh, uh, in media as you did? Or are you there because you cook great or because you own the first restaurant in the United States, uh, in the East or in the South. So I think it's a wide range. I don't know if they should narrow it or define it more. I mean, if my question to you, Greg, is like, if they were to make it more defined and more, you know, uh, something that we could texturalize and hold, what would we do? What, what should they do to narrow it? Uh, when I had Meathead on in the last hour, I said, to him that I thought the biggest issue or hurdle to overcome is as the Hall of Fame continues to make its way through and become more popular and do things like come on my show and, and do exclusive stuff to get in front of the target market, if you will. It, whenever they bought the horrible online existence as it was originally created and just kind of remained stagnant for any number of years and then the transaction happened, Maybe there should have been a really large induction at that point of people that were well in the past, a lot of people that have been deceased, big names. These people aren't going to be coming to any induction ceremonies or anything, like that, but they're names that are relevant, that added to the history and the culture and that are Hall of Fame worthy. I don't know if they're ever going to get brought back, even with the advent of this legacy category that is in there now that was just introduced. That, that to me, that's a disconnect that I don't know if, if – we will have enough time, and maybe we will because there's indefinite time ahead of us, and I assume this will continue on, where we make that correction. But until then, I think there's always going to be some kind of a look back over the shoulder on, is this correct or is it not? And I certainly believe that it's heading in the right direction. And there's plenty of stuff that you can just argue about minutiae that doesn't really matter. And I always said, we will know we are at the right spot for this Hall of Fame when all we're really doing is arguing about the names of nine on that short list, like the finalists for Major League Baseball, the finalists for the NFL. If that's all we're arguing about at that point, then we have hit every single other right spot because that's the only conversations that need to be taking place, and I don't know if we're in that place yet. Um, I'm all for... Uh, I, I, something happened to me today that's relevant to this, which is... Uh, so I decided I was going to cook a couple of rotisserie chickens for dinner. Yeah. And I, I got this, this added tool. I, I'm not going to name products because I, I, I don't want to cause trouble. But there's this tool that goes on my big green egg that's a rotisserie. And I've not done much rotisserie cooking, so I've been doing that. And it's a lot of fun, and it's easy, and, and usually turns out pretty well, although I kind of screwed the pooch tonight. I'm going to admit that. Uh, but where did I go to get my chicken? About 15 miles from my house here, two butchers started a meat automat in Hudson, New York. Meat now, automat? An automat, like what used to be Horn and Hard Arts and these old automats in New York City and where you'd go in and put a quarter in and get your lunch, get your meatloaf. Yeah. <laughs> they do it with meat. I, I think they're geniuses. Wow. I can go in there 24-7 and get fresh chicken or fresh pork butt or, or steak or they do sausage mixes. It, it's, it's beyond brilliant. And like, well, why wouldn't they at some point go into the barbecue hall of fame? Right. It's innovative. It contributes greatly. And uh, I, I'm, I bet you you have listeners out there that are going to just steal this idea and open up a meat automat where they live. Ohio State had a similar item, but it was only for bacon. They had bacon vending machines installed <laughs> in a uh, like a spring semester a year or two ago, and it was like easily the hottest selling thing. It was always sold out. I'm not, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> so whatever, whatever. Why are why isn't this a national franchise? Why can't I go get? Yeah. Why, I can get bacon at the meat automat, but I can get every other cut of meat. But what happened to the bacon automat? Well, then they just took them out like it's a, a special time, you know, thing maybe for finals or something like that just to keep people motivated. But then I think they realized they were not going to be able to keep this thing stocked no matter what. 
and then they were ultimately hiked off campus and that was it but it was a rousing success perhaps bigger than they thought it, it it sounds like with the right kind of planning and the right research and development they could probably do that nationwide there's certainly i could have brought home bacon tonight and uh i, I think i think that um they hit it before the pandemic happened. They were doing this automat thing in Kingston, New York, and one other location. And the, the 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 you know the wheel, the roulette wheel, has turned and right in the right direction for them. Yeah. And it's pretty great. I will tell you that one of my uh, occasionally I'll get like intrigued by certain little concepts and 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 I'll even invest in something a little bit, you know, to be part of it. And I got talked into what's considered the holy grail of vending machines. What would you guess, Greg, that would be? What's the holy grail of vending machines? Uh, beer? Uh, beer's good, but that's, uh, you know, that's out there, right? There's beer, there's beer vending machines, I, I think, aren't there? I don't know how you could possibly do that. That would seem to be highly illegal. Uh, well, I guess, you know, I, I live in parts of New York where a lot of illegal things happen. <laughs> But, okay, the holy grail of vending is the French fry. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, right. And they have tried for almost 30 years to perfect the French fry vending machine. I just don't see how that could possibly happen. I mean, there's so uh, – are you frying it? Are you air frying it? Uh, I mean, Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think Orida got in on it, and they oh, tried oh. with, you know, frozen potatoes. They tried, yeah. tried to do it that way. This particular invention, which was uh, backed by a, a well-known name of someone who had countless, endless funds, mm. uh, the way it worked was it was a uh, it was a mix. It was a powder that got hydrated. Water was added to the powder, and then it formed a paste, which was extruded through a like a filter that turned it into French fries, and then dropped into hot oil. Oh my! Oh my! And I saw this thing work, and I thought, you know what? I don't know what it's going to take to just be part of this, but I'm in. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Lost every penny. Oh, I, oh, I, 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 Oil I, inside of a vending machine screams <laughs> disaster to me. I, I mean, I don't even see how that could be approved. I, 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 I consider me a sucker for things that really taste good. These yes. things were fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I want it to happen, believe me, but the practical side of me sees nothing but disaster waiting to happen. You know, Greg, I only wish to God I had known you back then. <laughs> I could have saved you. Asked, I would have probably, you know, been able to keep, keep a hold of that dough. But, but it was a great adventure and a lot of fun. And... The truth is, the first time I got to go and actually test one of the machines, I went to this guy's apartment. He had two machines there. He had a penthouse at the UN Plaza, which is sort of a fancy, fancy place. Oh, wow. And I, I know this story makes me sound like a ripe grape, but if <laughs> then so be it. And, and I put the buck in the machine. He said, just do it. Just get your French fries. Oh, oh. And, and the tip off was that at lunch when I met with him, he was already drunk. Yes. Yes. So that should have, I should have been out. But I bought the French fries, put in the money. I saw the machine work mm -hmm. and it's, it actually spit them out all over the floor. Oh, it didn't even work that good. It didn't even work that good. And I was still in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, getting you to spend the money and watching it work. If it would have came out in the little paper boat, maybe that. That would have probably been it. You probably would have been at your parents asking them for every red cent, too, and everybody would have been on the poor farm. I would have brought so many people down with me. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, that would be crazy. But, that, I mean, that guy had it right. I mean, he was having you buy in literally, watching yes. it work. And, it, I mean, you were, you were hook, line, and sinker at that point. I think those people are called fun. con artists where I come from, John. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Spitting French fries across the floor. Uh, let me uh, let me let me ask you one question here because um, I have uh, Dave Bosk coming up here in a few minutes. I was talking with Meathead again at the end, talking about uh, you know the state of barbecue television, and I refer to your run as the golden years of oh, barbecue nice. TV. Uh, well, it, thank you. It we was had a, we had some good years, many years, and I mean, John, a lot of people that I talked to, even uh, the two guys I'm going to be doing an interview with tomorrow for their podcast. Both were inspired originally by the Barbecue Pitmasters TV show. And, I mean, it's been countless numbers of people that come on when I say, hey, how did you get into barbecue? Uh, inevitably, 
if it's not the first or second thing they say, it's always barbecue pitmasters in some form or fashion. So it's off the table now. There doesn't appear to be anybody looking to make some semblance of what a barbecue pitmasters used to look like in whatever form that was, and there were plenty of iterations there, both uh, good, bad, and ugly, depending on who you're asking. There was an attempt at a pay-per-view event this evening. Did you did you know about this? Did you see this going across the interwebs I, I, at all? No, I didn't know about it, and I can only imagine what that was like. Do you think at, at all, knowing what we know about streaming television and people wanting uh, things to be handed to them and uh, where or where not the pop is that right the popularity of uh, competition barbecue is do you think that that could be a viable platform going forward talking about I mean holding everything aside of course uh, audio production video production all this but from a concept standpoint do you think a pay-per-view platform getting six of the best competition cooks together and putting something together has some legs in the future uh, you know, it all comes down to the execution. Yes, the answer is yes. And uh, it all comes down to uh, the people you cast in it. Uh, are you, uh, I mean, you know, after we ran for like in various, you know, iterations, we ran eight, nine seasons on the show. Yep. As I like to say, it was the only show I've ever worked on that was canceled five times. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, if, if, it has to be new, Greg. In some way, there has to be. And, and I pitched to the network uh, about how to take the show when it was getting tired and make it new. But they felt they knew better at that point. So yeah. they didn't. They, but I think there is a way to do it. Let me put it this way, Greg. And this is going to sound like really uh, egotistical. Great. Yes. The answer is yes. If I did it. Yes. You know what? That's what Meathead said. That's what he's like. If John Marcus wasn't a part of this, he's like, then it's probably doomed from the beginning. So, because he's a guy you know, that knows production, that knows production value, that has the eye for it. And if he's not a part of it, I fear for everybody involved. Hey, the truth is, there's somebody that's going to come along and going to have great ideas and is a fan. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I certainly would love to be part of it. Let's put it that way. And pay per view, your big struggle with doing it as pay per view is that you really the minimum time cooking stuff is like four hours yeah what you what do you do with that time you know and and you got to figure out a way to to have it during the down times to have things that are compelling and interesting and fun to watch and yeah there's a way to do it but you gotta like spend some money and plan it and you gotta have the right cast you have to have people in it that like are new and different and feel feel like they're bringing new energy to it and excitement to it. It's, 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 it's tough to do it right, but it, you can do it. John, I certainly appreciate the time this evening, and you can follow John socially on the Twitter at BBQ Pitmasters, uh, where he may or may not be musing more one day than the other, but uh, just like all of us here as we work through this coronavirus. I uh, hope you stay well, and uh, let's do this again a lot sooner than three years from now. I, I, uh, I've missed doing it. So, uh, anytime. All right. It's thanks. great to be here. There Thank he you, is. man. You got it. John okay. Marcus right there on the show. He's won Emmys for crying out loud and he's sitting here right on the show. All right. I apologize. Cause I'm going, I'm going from one to the next, believe it or not. I am going to go from one to the next. Joining me now is the pit master of uh, what is the longest running uh oh uh oh uh oh I hope he got that note now I'm wondering if I screwed up I don't know I'll, I'll go back Ooh, that looked like he had been hacked at some point is that right let's see Nope. Uh oh. Okay. Quickly going back. Oh, oh, oh. It's not online. What? Hmm. What if we try the the phone? Oh, boy. Let's go to the phone. 
It's gonna it's gonna ring. Ooh, I hate that. But now I'm in uncharted territory here, so I don't know. We'll go with a phone call. Were you seeing me come up on Skype? You what? Were you seeing me come up on Skype or no? Nope. Nope. Hmm. Did you change names? I don't know that answer. Butcher BBQ. Butcher BBQ? Yeah. Right, hold on. Hold on. Let's see. B U T C H. Is it one word, Butcher BBQ? No. Butcher BBQ. Oh, there you are. Okay, I'm going to hang up with you right now. Yep. All right. I mean, yeah, he did. What's your BBQ? This is probably what they call the uh, the show line. Wow. Hey, hey. Oh, my Lord. There he is, sounding like a million bucks. Looking like a billion bucks, by the way. Now we're... Rocking and rolling here. So you did. I think you. I think you might have had a Dave Bosca Skype, and then I forgot that you did one for probably for the show, right? Yeah, that's probably yeah, right. All right, so we're ready to go. Here. I probably forgot too. That's all right. I knew we would figure it out. I mean, we are a veritable brain trust between the two of us. Be blowing up cities and yeah. changing regimes without any doubt. So I uh, apologize for being late here, but I was talking with John Marcus about some uh, good times, old times, and new times here. So. Uh, speaking of new times, by the way, uh, this is what we call new product announcement time, which is my favorite time. Dave, you're ever the innovator. I mean, as a guy who has a incredible product line existing already for the butcher product uh, for the butcher barbecue products, then you started the uh, wild seasonings line, which is uh, you know more of the game kind of stuff, uh, sausage and so forth, and then continuing to add to the product's portfolio, we are ready to introduce a new product. I mean, I've, I've seen it kind of rolling out here, but first on, a, on this show tonight. What do we introduce? I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking no. about? <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> everybody knows, and I can, off the Barbecue Pitmasters, the All-Stars edition, we used a product called Barbecue Mud. Hmm. Everybody knows what that is as far as what it was on. Every time that show re-airs, I get phone calls. I get text messages. I'm still getting emails with people going, where can I find this? Where can I find this? And what it is is it is a very thick beef product, and we've made it more retail-friendly than what we had exactly on the show. But it is the same flavor. We've got the same dry spices in it that what we had there. It is a liquid version, and it should be out in about 10 days. Hmm. This is going to be something that you're adding to a brisket in place of something? Uh, so uh, you, rubs or stuff, or is it like a soak or, or what? Or like a big thick um, uh, covering, like a big blanket? It is very thick in texture. Yeah. Uh, when you shake up a bottle... It'll coat the inside of the bottle, without a doubt. Whenever, let's say you marinate your steaks, uh, your portobello mushrooms, I've given it to about 10 people around here to go cook with. I didn't give them any ideas. I just said, here, here's something I want you to cook with. And I took their ideas. I took their thoughts. I, I listened to ups and downs. We've been using this for probably two years wow. in all honesty. It's just that it's now that's at the final form to where I'm very happy and it can be mass produced. Um, I have a made in Oklahoma product here. This is made in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hmm. So it is a, a homegrown product without a doubt. And you've obviously seen success with it on the competition trail. So from that perspective, it is a proven product, but now you're giving it to people to cook with. So as I like to say when I'm uh, doing your read, not only is are, are your products tested on the competition circuit, but also well-proven here when I'm using them in the backyard. I mean, my girls uh, uh, love the honey rub, love a lot of your sauces and stuff. So uh, you're seeing success from a, a lot of different things. It's not just relegated to a backyard or the competition scene. You get it from both ends, which is, from a business standpoint, uh, really good too. So uh, the barbecue mud is going to be coming out. Is this like a pre-order thing or just uh, mark your calendars 10 days from now and come back and hit the website and start ordering? I'm thinking in 10 days it should be on the website to order. And I've been using it in my brisket uh, wrap. 
Um, so in competition, that's what I've been using it on. Okay. Um, new products outside of barbecue mud. Do you see any more coming in the year of 2020 or is this going to be it? No, there's a good chance there's a couple more coming down the road. Wow, we- this uh, lock-in place thing is, has got me doing too much. I was going to say, <laughs> I mean, when, when you're not on the road doing your normal run of barbecue competitions, uh, I mean, you're either stuck in a place where you're just going crazy or you're realizing that you're trapped in place, and now the creative yeah. juices start flowing. So whether you're working on uh, shows to get in the backlog or – other products to continue to diversify. You're obviously taking the the action versus just sitting there wondering when it's all going to end. Yeah, I've always been the one to step out of the box. And that's, I mean, I got the grilling oils. We've got these injections. We've got this mud coming out. And the reason it's taken me so long to to do this is, I just was never happy with what we used on the show. I mean, it was good, but it wasn't retailable. I don't know if that's a word or not, but hey, I, like I don't it. know if it's retailable. Yeah. Um, but I'm very happy with this finished product. I mean, I am super, super happy with it. How do you go from something that you don't feel you can retail and work it into a retailable product? A lot of testing, a lot of testing. I went up to the place that's making this for me, and I said, okay, this is what I've got. This is what I've been doing. Let's take what you have as far as your ingredients and let's do this. This is what I want to do with it. And let's tell me if it can be put into your kettles and cooked and, and processed out and go through your bottling system. And there were some yeses, some nos, um, things like that. But actually what this is, this is a very, gosh, I wish I, I gave my last bottle to Levi um, yesterday. He was cooking some tri-tips. So I wish I had some. I'd show you what the, the, the finished product looks like. But it's going to come in a bottle like our liquid injections. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's going to be rich, thick, and black. Um, that's the best way to describe it. Was there ever a point where you thought you weren't going to be able to get it to where you wanted it to, to bring it to retail? Or you always thought that there was going to be some things you could change around to get it there? For the last four years, yes, I never thought I was going to be able to. Oh, really? Wow. We <laughs> yeah, wow. It, I, because I kept trying it in a paste form like what we had, mm-hmm. and that's where we were having problems with it was getting it packaged in paste form and the flavor stay in what I wanted because with it being in a paste form, how everybody, if they did it the way I was doing it on the show, rub it on the outside, the the thickness, how much you put on, did it fall off when it was soaking in? Did it fall off when it was cooking? There was never anything that would make a great finished product hmm. until I decided to go liquid. Then it covered all surfaces. Dave Bosco joining me here on the show. ButcherBBQ.com is the website. In about 10 days from now, you can head on over and grab some barbecue mud, as he said. Uh, and that's a great name. Is that just something that fell off the tongue? Or, I mean, how does that name come about? Well, we were actually sitting at the our table on the show, and we were we were putting it on some ribeyes. Um, I think there were cowboy ribeyes, and we tested it. We tasted. It, and we thought ah, it needs a little something. Levi said, "Well, let's put this on there," which what we'd had because we'd used it at the house on from prime ribs, and we're sitting there just applying it. And one of the judges, I don't even remember who which one, but I'm thinking it was Myron, said, said David, what do you got there? And I heard Levi whisper in my ear. He said, looks like uh, mud. And I just <laughs> looked up at him and I said, it's barbecue mud. <laughs> and that's that's how it got its name. <laughs> wow, stuck ever since. And that's why everybody's been asking you about barbecue mud. I mean, it's amazing that just little off-the-cuff things like that are what people – latch on to and they see you okay so you win that category you end up winning that show and you end up winning this and, that, and they all roll it back to barbecue mutt that's what he used to win and now yeah. they're asking you for it i mean it just goes to show it just only takes one thing for people to latch on to you see you see a little success and now all this thing starts to gain momentum and here you are all these years later of thinking this thing was going to wind up dead in the water ready to bring to market if you Google it right now, there is still an active thread on one of the barbecue forums that is still talking about this product. Every time it re-airs, someone gets on there and asks another question. Has anybody seen this yet or, or, or questions about it? What do you think it is? Things like that. So 
it is still active and it's out there. So I'm pretty excited. Well, you're going to be closing and the not loop. Only, go ahead. I'm so sorry. No, I was going to say you're finally closing the loop on this one too. Yeah. And not only can you go to our website, I highly love sending people to our stores. We are pre-ordering right now with our retail stores and that's just our SOP yep. and we will ship it to the stores and so we want you to be able to go there and find it as well as our website all at the same time. From a competition standpoint this year, Dave, I know it's still looking a little weird and some places might uh, look like they're opening a little bit more than others. Are you foreseeing some competitions here before the end of the year or have you made other plans to stay busy outside of competition? Then? We had to one this weekend. Oh, you did? We are. We are this coming. Oh, oh okay. This coming weekend. Uh, where is that one at? Wagner, Oklahoma. There's 60 teams in it. Holy boy. And it's going to be a pretty stacked one. It's going to be a real fun one. It'll be fun to see everybody again. But we get this one uh, kicked off and rolling. And then we've got a big hiatus, unless I want to travel a couple states away. But I'm going to do everything I can on my end to support the contest in Oklahoma at the end of the year. There, It seems like all of them are just stacking in real quick um one on top of another but we're going to do everything we can if they're willing to have a contest for us i want to go cook it is there anything that they have told you that you're going to have to do as far as distance or staying away from people or anything like that or is it just throwing caution to the wind and as as normal as it was last year no it's not normal as last year um whoever does your turn in boxes will have to be carrying a and I'm going to call the brand Clorox wipe, one of the yep, yep, uh, cleaner wipes. And in front of the reps, before you set it down, you will have to clean the outside of the box with this uh, cleaner before you give it to them so that it can go into the judge's tent in a clean manner. Okay. Uh, but they haven't said that every team has got to set up uh, so many feet apart or uh, no social collecting. Or I mean, look, I mean, you get 60 teams together in a place what hasn't seen each other in three months and doing what they normally do. I talked to guys that run the Pitmasters podcast out there in Utah when they did the state contest there a couple of weeks ago. And they said, geez, we didn't even realize it. But then all of a sudden we're just all collected together because we haven't seen each other in a while. And we're doing what we like and innately we're human and we want to group together. And all of a sudden we're being yelled at, you know, get six feet apart, get six feet apart. I would assume you're anticipating a similar things happening you guys are just going to get together because it's just going to happen it's going to yes I, I i assume something will happen like that but this particular contest they've got a stacked in like uh cordwood on the on the street where there is like a two block area they're putting 60 yeah. teams so well, i wait. think that it's going to be yeah. self-induced for the organizer yeah, no doubt uh so uh, are you worried about that at all or you know fuck it I take precautions. I'm not stupid with it. I don't go overboard with it, but I respect anybody that does uh, have to or want to. I've got a 77-year-old mom that I don't want to bring this home to. We've got a, a eight-month-old grandchild I don't want to bring this home to. So I do my precautions. I don't. I don't preach it, but I don't condone anybody who does who wants to uh, live that. That's that's great. All right, uh, Dave Bosco for Butcher Barbecue joining me here on the show. Uh, Dave, you're 31 episodes in. I assume you're getting ready to release another one here, so probably closer to 32. But 31 currently available in your podcast feed. Uh, are you still good on content as far as the show goes? And uh, how have things changed over the first 31 shows? Yes, we've got, I've got a lot of people on deck, I should call it. Um, we have been so busy for the last two weeks that I haven't had a chance to do a lot with it. But, and... Our internet hasn't helped here. Um, we've been struggling with good internet on top of that. And it's hard to run an internet business without internet, let alone uh -huh. trying to uh, tape a podcast. I uh, Right now, I have two computers running. One we're working with you on with a, a hot box, and i got another one right here beside me. Yeah. That's running on a, a different Wi-Fi system because I can't use as much bandwidth on one versus the other. Oh, wow. So it's it's – it's been difficult as far as that, but yes, I, I'm enjoying doing them. And what's changed was I would say episode 10 or 11. I started doing the old fashioned job. I, I put some time in it and 
uh, started editing it and I felt like I got okay at it. I, I think there's some to do. I've leaned on you a lot, listened to a lot of what you said. I highly respect that. And thank you for your sure. insights on that. No doubt. Uh, your most recent show uh, I was listening to while I was painting bedrooms last week and it was really good. You were talking with your uh, marketing and, and branding guy and through a lot of key items. One that stuck out to me was consistency through the brand, especially the logo and while you have made some minor tweaks here and there, depending on what product you are using a, a different logo on, a podcast or a new line of seasoning, whatever the case may be, there were a lot of things that were smacking of the Butcher Barbecue product line. Why do you guys decide to maintain that versus going in a completely different direction if you're doing something completely different? There's something that's coming out here real quick, and I, I'm – obligated i can't talk about too much but they wanted to use my name on it and i'm like guys you go google up david bosca what do you find yeah right butcher barbecue you go google up butcher <laughs> barbecue what do you find yeah. there's a whole lot more so the brand name is what's out there and that's 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 why we push the brand butcher barbecue. We changed the podcast from white to a yellow background. I just wanted something a little bit different with that. As far as a marketing type, I just wanted it to stand out to where if they seen that the, the logo is there and that's what I was still wanted to remain the same. But on the other side, I wanted it to be an eye appeal and stand just a little different. Dave Bosca is the pit master of Butcher Barbecue. You can look for the new product, Barbecue Mud, coming out in about 10 days. So make sure you hit up the website over there and grab yourself a bottle or 17. I'm sure Dave will be much appreciate on that. And in the meantime, subscribe to his podcast. And uh, continued success this coming weekend, Dave. Uh, bring home the grand champion. As you know, you show up here on a Tuesday. You win on a Saturday. Oh, yeah. It's just the way it happens, so it's a lock. But uh, we'll uh, we'll wish you good luck anyway since you're on the show. And I always appreciate the time and the long-time sponsorship of the show, Dave. I uh, really appreciate it. Greg, thanks a lot. I appreciate the time. You got it. There he is, Dave Bosca from Butcher Barbecue right there as we are a little long right now, but more than happy to do that. So I have some things that I need to get done. First... In the name of reads, like the Butcher Barbecue read, believing that outdoor cooking can be easy and fun because it can be, especially with the Monolith Barbecue Edition Grill, the world's first true temperature-controlled smoker with a built-in power draft fan. This means smarter control and greater freedom with automatic pit temperature control devices. Easily choose your cooking time and temperature. Let the monolith do the work of a sous chef or a barbecue pit master. And with minimal effort, you now have oven-like precision at the grill. You can serve the tastiest, juicy meals each and every time. And if you have a barbecue guru controller already, just hook it right up to the fan and away you go. Two new controllers out there as well, the DynaQ and the UltraQ, bbqguru.com, or call them at 800-288-GURU. And... The uh, segment with John Marcus was brought to you by Smithfield. Head to smithfield.com throughout the grilling season for recipes as well as tips and tricks from world champion pitmaster like Chris Lilly, Darren Worth, er Ernest Cervantes, and Childs Cridlin, mouthwatering flavor, and no artificial ingredients, a hallmark of Smithfield fresh pork. Quite simply, some of the finest pork money can buy. It's trusted choice of world champion pitmasters for use at home and at competitions. We're back to wrap. The whole show right after this. Stick around. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpy. And rounding it out, the Smoke Sheet, a free weekly newsletter that keeps you in the know on everything happening in the barbecue world, including top news, events, recipes, and more, started by Ryan Cooper and Sean Ludwig, both of them traveling around the country to find the best barbecue news, and then report on it. Sign up for it at bbqnewsletter.com. That's bbqnewsletter.com, a great all-in-one source covering the live fire industry. And we are now caught up. So let's do this. Let's get on out while the getting's good. All the way back in the first hour, we talked with Meathead. 
Father's Day gifts. Pay-per-view platforms not making the Hall of Fame. Second hour, John Marcus and an extended return to the show, which was appreciated. And closing it out with Dave Bosca. He has barbecue mud coming in about 10 days. Head on over to ButcherBBQ.com to grab yours. 10 days time. That's the 19th. And you can be a champion like he was on the TV show. How about that? We had the guy that did the TV show's creation and the guy that won the TV show. And Dave Bosca, back to back. That's what you find on this show. Professionalism and top notch all the time. All the time. We got a big show planned for you next week. It's already booked out all the way. Stephen Reichland in, Robin Lindars in. I got other guests that I can't remember right off the top of my The whole show is booked already. This I can tell you. Actually, the fourth Tuesday is almost all booked already, too. But June is a fifth month or a fifth Tuesday month. So bonus Tuesday show. September 11th, 2001. I will never forget. And until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, it's your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now. Q Central.